Welcome to Our Medicine 2020, Day 3. I am Peter Higgins, and I'll be moderating our session this morning. I wanted to give you a couple of updates. Our workshops from Thursday, 101 Intro to R for Clinicians and 201 Intro to Tidy Models, will be posted tonight. So schedule that in for a bit of Sunday watching, if you'd like. Uh, but they'll all be available to all registrants, whether you attended that workshop or not. We will have a feedback form at the end of the meeting. We'll have only three questions, but because we made a lot of changes this year from an in-person meeting with cheese steaks in Philadelphia to an all virtual meeting, we need a lot of feedback, particularly on the format, how it works, keeping it in-person versus virtual, or going to some form of hybrid. We want to have active participation, so we encourage you to use the Crowdcast chat button to chat in real time. Use the ask a question button and upvote questions that you would like to hear the answers to, whether you ask a question or not. And also participate in the sidebar discussion on Twitter. You need to hashtag our medicine 2020 and follow at our medicine, but there's a lot going on there as well and people sharing a lot of what's going on in the meeting. Uh, this is an example of the chat window. Just jump in, state your opinion, or if things don't make sense, if you're thinking about formulating a question, it's a great place to discuss. And to ask a question, just hit the button at the bottom of the screen called Ask a Question. Click on the orange button and fire away. And I also want to encourage future participation. Uh, we need people to be on the organizing committee, on the programming committee. It takes a lot of work to put all this together. And I particularly want to thank Beth Atkinson, who put the program together, Stefan Kaduke, who organized the entire meeting, including the platform, and Daniela Mark, who's been helping us keep the platform roaming all three days. And so just email Danielle to volunteer for next year. Today's themes, we're going to start with R in clinical practice with Ewan Harrison doing our keynote, followed by a number of uh, submitted presentations. Theme five will be R Medicine Shiny Apps, led off by Chris Beeling. And theme six, R in COVID-19, with a keynote by Patrick Mathias, looking at all the applications of R to the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll have birds of the feather sessions on imaging analysis, minorities in our medicine, reproducible research, COVID-19, and geospatial mapping. Again, just a reminder about the code of contact. I think things went very well yesterday, but particularly in the chat, no harassment. And uh, this full uh, code of conduct is at this website, the, the Linux Foundation. Uh, and no screenshots or recordings or photographs of birds of the feather as participants have not consented to have their photographs shared. You can take screenshots of slides during the presentations and share those on Twitter if that's something you want to do, but not personal photos. I want to thank all of our sponsors who helped us put us together, as particularly as we change the format uh, late in the game, and particularly our consortium who gave us bridge funding to keep it going. Um, and today I want to lead off our keynote with Ewan Harrison. He's a professor of surgery and data science an honorary consultant surgeon at the University of Edinburgh. He is known in large part for his large surgical research networks, for the final fit package, and for work in uh, our education, uh, particularly in low resource countries. And he'll be speaking on from cancer to COVID scale and agility in global health research using R. And we will switch over to Ewan. Am I shading? Can you see me? We can see you. Uh, I think you need to share your slides again. Is that good? Looks good. Yes, we can see them. Great. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak at this meeting. It's an absolute delight. The format I found great, and I loved yesterday's talks, and I, I loved the chat, and 
it does feel like this is a new way of doing things. So I'm really grateful to the organisers for putting on such a great meeting. So I am a, a surgeon and a data scientist, and I, I don't know what life decisions I took to end up where I am today, where it all went wrong. I did a PhD in the lab, and uh, I liked the numbers more than the pipette, and ended up doing a statistics degree after that. And so I now spend half of my time caring for patients with cancer, and the other half wrestling often with R to try and work out how to make that patient care better. So I started in R in 2004, which is making me feel really old. This is how it looked. It was just the console, just the script window, no color. Uh, if you did something right, then a plot would uh, pop up into a third window, but uh, that was about it. There was no R Studio, there was no Tidyverse, there was no Markdown. But goodness, what opportunities it opened up. So I guess the, the first promise of health data science is something like this, an interconnected health data ecosystem where information from electronic patient records, from imaging, from labs, from omics is aggregated together with data that may come directly from the patient, maybe from sensors, maybe from social media. But what's important is that is aggregated, it is analysed and it's turned into actionable output that a clinician can use to improve patient care. Now, some of these arrows exist in some places, but we're really quite far from this reality in most health systems that patients around the world have access to. And then the second promise of health data science is really truly meaningful improvements in patient care. And that might be around diagnostics, including all the great work being done in medical imaging. It might be around decision support, it might be around the actual delivery of treatments, you know, when we're now using, you know, robots on a day to day basis in surgery. It might be about follow up of patients or quality assurance of patient care. Probably or possibly, most importantly, it might be actually about deriving uh, new treatments and performing performing clinical trials. So this is a really pragmatic talk. I see it from being at the front line of medicine, where really what matters is the improvement of patient care. A theme that I hope that will come out is the the importance of the assembly of high quality data that is actually processed and actioned in real time. It's not data disappearing into silos, but it's actually turning into useful information that clinicians can use in real time. I've made the emphasis here on the use of R and the tools that we use on a day-to-day -day basis, together with a few tips of things that I think are useful, some of which you'll know already. But rather than really talking about the kind of details of the, the studies themselves. So I'm going to focus on three areas. How do we gather high quality prospective patient data, often in global settings at scale? And I'm going to use the Global Surge Cancer Study, which is just finishing or just, just finished at the moment, to talk about REDCap and what a wonderful tool REDCap together with R is to talk about our liberal use of Shiny, some apps that we've put together, the final fit package that Peter mentioned earlier. And then I'll go on to something different, uh, which is using smartphones for follow-up, but really practical use of this in real uh, patient care for Granny in Scotland, who doesn't really know what an app is uh, and certainly doesn't know what Bluetooth uh, or the like is. And I'll use, uh, so this is a randomised controlled trial actually about uh, predicting wound infection uh, using, I've called it smartphone selfies here, but, but using uh, questionnaires on wounds and taking photographs of wounds in patients after surgery in order to try and determine whether they're going to become infected or not. And I'm going to talk about integration with Twilio 
uh, which you'll know is a, a, a cloud-based communications platform uh, together with uh, Keras and, and TensorFlow. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the, the COVID bit uh, and uh, how, how can we do really speedy, agile, real-time data analysis, but that, that is of high quality. I mean, if that's something which has come out you know, over the course of the pandemic, it's the difficulties when research is not of the highest standards. Uh, and we'll uh, finish up just with a few words on, on, on healthy R, our approach to teaching R using notebooks and everything that Renu and I have done uh, together wrapped up in R for Health Data Science, which is uh, going to be published in November of this year. Yeah, so and that final one, I'll, I'll be uh, talking about RStudio Connect uh, and prognostic modeling and just an approach to prognostic modeling, mixing uh, uh, machine learning approaches with uh, with GANs and Lasso. So in 2018, 16 million people around the world will be diagnosed with, with cancer. And four out of five of them will need surgery but fewer than one in four will have access to high quality, timely, available surgical care. The incidence of cancer is rising worldwide in all countries. Mortality has plateaued in some, but continues to rise, particularly in low and middle income countries. But here's the rub. What do we know about the provision of surgical cancer services worldwide? What do we know about the quality of surgical cancer care? What do we know about outcomes after cancer surgery? And I'm particularly interested at the moment in the immediate outcomes of surgery. So surgery within 30 days rather than longer term oncological outcomes. And the answer to that is almost nothing. So over the last five years, uh, colleagues in Birmingham and ourselves have met lots of fantastic people about the world in order to put this research collaboration together. It's now 5,000 clinicians strong across over 100 countries who are all dedicated to the improvement of surgical care around the world. We do research. The research is ideally driven by the priorities of those living in low and middle income countries, and certainly not by those in high income countries. The setting up of this collaborative and how it functions and you know what a great bunch of people it is, is all a separate talk, which I didn't think was as relevant to the kind of R flavor of the talk today. I'm happy, be delighted to uh, you know to, to speak to anyone on a, on a kind of one-to-one -one basis about all the, the details of that after this. So the Global Surge three study was a worldwide cohort study in uh, cancer surgery, looking at early outcomes after cancer and the quality that may predict that. It's a really big study. There's about 120 variables collected. There's lots of sub studies within that, uh, and so today. I'm really just going to concentrate uh, on the stage of presentation. So how advanced is a cancer when it comes to the light of doctors within different settings, within different countries, at different income levels? And to what extent does that explain differences or potential differences in the outcome of surgery? And we're focusing on this in breast, gastric and colon cancer. Uh, because these are the most common cancers across the world, both in terms of incidence uh, and in uh, terms of mortality. REDCap has become central to our operations, partly because it integrates so well with uh, R and R Studio. I'm sure you'll be familiar with it. Electronic data capture service uh, or system rather, uh, Rob Taylor and colleagues at Vanderbilt have just done an amazing job keeping this uh, moving and providing such a fantastic, uh, such a fantastic system. 
So any project that we do now that's not using routinely collected data will often use REDCap as the as the primary database. Uh, in particular, the you know things like the extensive data quality rules that can be implemented really help reduce errors, uh, particularly when you're gathering data in a, a global setting. It's got an amazing API, uh, which makes interaction with the data itself itself, you know, in any, any ways, but particularly using R, an absolute breeze. So Kenny McLean is a PhD in the lab with me. I think he presented this at R Medicine last year, but he's put together uh, the collaborator package, uh, which really helps the uh, running these collaborative projects and particularly the management of you know these two or three thousand individuals that all need appropriate data uh, access rights and need to be seeing the right patients in the right hospital etc and it really helps with that I mean the red cap API to R is is really easy here's some code I, was, I promised I would put some code in so there's using R curl a simple post farm call uh, to REDCap, that will pull all of the data from a particular project uh, into, into R. There's some packages now that, that wrap up the API. REDCapper is, is great. I don't know if anyone from that package is at this meeting, but we use it a lot. It does batching uh, really well. Uh, and it means that you can just pull the data uh, you know, live at any time onto your R server and, and use it to do it in, in, uh, in real-time analysis. So the API works really well, up to about uh, up to about fifty million cells, and then it's and, and then it, it it starts to just just as APIs always do uh, fail. None of the packages at the moment have got uh, make particularly good use of uh, try catch or or other ways of dealing with errors. Uh, but uh, PER, which you'll be familiar with the package, I love it. I map every day, I think. Uh, uh, but it's got this, these really good functions, which, uh, which, which many people don't know about, insistently. So you can wrap your function in insistently, uh, which modifies it to retry a given number of time. Uh, you can implement exponential back off, just meaning that the time between uh, each uh, run of the function increases, uh, and this really smooths out the pool. So we so we now pool, you know, up to five hundred million cells, uh, you know, straight from Redcap onto uh, an R Studio server with with no problem, just using that simple wrap. So we really use Shiny a lot, uh, and I mean, Shiny is fantastic, as, as as I'm sure you all know, just for the the speed and agility with with in which you can get things up and running. The pro these projects are complicated to run, and we need to give uh, national leads. We need, need to give leaders around the world, world tools in order to help them facilitate uh, data access. So we've got REDCap authorship projects, REDCap data projects, and they'll just pull routinely uh, into uh, in, into a shiny app, and then we can just put up anything that we want to help people uh, use. And run the project. So here, for instance, uh, I don't know how well this projects, but you know which patients were collected at which times, what data is missing, what's the data quality like, which teams have pulled which data, who signed off the data, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That allows them to go to an individual and say, "Look, your data is poor quality. What's going on? You need to improve this." And, and so we just get the best quality data now coming in. It's it's uh, it's absolutely phenomenal. We can we can push to public facing websites. It's really easy. Our Studio Connect has now made that you know an absolute breeze. Uh, so we we've tried a bit of gamifying data collection, you know, around, around quality and around uh, completeness. You've got to be careful that people just don't make it up in order to win the game. But you can you can make uh, your you know the, the the state of play at any given time now uh, really easy to really easy to show. So what so what have we got in this in this global search three uh, project? Well, across a relatively short space of time, we got sixteen thousand patients collected by over two thousand collaborators, eight hundred and thirty six teams, four hundred and twenty eight hospitals across eighty two countries. Peter mentioned yesterday uh, his uh, 
ideas around concert diagrams, that would be fantastic. I'd be really keen to, to help with that. We do use Diagrammer, which someone mentioned in the chat. I find it really difficult to use. I, I the, the, the kind of dot language, I just, just doesn't uh, make sense to me. I've actually started pushing with the Lucid Chart API. I don't know if anyone's using Lucid Chart, but I, that's a, a, a service out with R. Uh, and that works. I'm finding that work, works well. But I'd love to. Uh, I'd, I'd love to take part in that project. So we have sixteen thousand patients with good spread across country income level. Good spread across our gastric, uh, breast, and colon cancers, representing the, the prevalence in the in, in the communities of those diseases. So I said we would we would think about cancer stage and about uh, mortality, about early outcomes after surgery. To what extent does late presentation of disease in poorer countries reflect on poorer early outcomes? And here on the uh, x-axis, you've got country income level. On y-axis, you've got the proportion of patients and these lines uh, so this is, as I'm sure you know, a faceted GG plot. These lines represent the proportion of patients in each income setting uh, by stage of cancer. And you can see the blue line there, early stage disease for breast dropping off rapidly as you go from environments in which breast screening is just part of the infrastructure to, to where it is not. Uh, same for gastric cancer, where, where, where screening programs exist. Same for colorectal cancer, where screening programs exist. And stage two and stage three disease, so locally advanced disease, stage four disease, metastatic disease, increasing as you go from high uh, to low income settings. It is clear from the data, as would be expected, that cancers present later in low income, uh, in low income settings. This is a really detailed analysis, which, which again, just for the purposes of this talk, I've just reduced it to one slide. So I would love to talk about this in, in detail to, to, uh, to others. Uh, so how does mortality rate differ between countries? Again, as would be expected, we found a significantly increased rate of mortality in low and middle income countries. So that's the top bars uh, there. Uh, up to, for instance, 10% mortality after gastric cancer surgery in low and lower middle income country groups. Uh, but um, skipping through a lot of analysis and, and uh, a lot of work, uh, these differences do persist uh, in models adjusted uh, you know, for patient characteristics uh, such as performance status, comorbidity, age, sex, when adjusted for stage of disease, which we've just talked about, and uh, in differences in procedure factors. So we now do a lot of hierarchical logistic regression modeling, both using LME4, the Elmer functions for continuous data, and Glimmer for, uh, for uh, GLM. And no, I'm talking about it today, but in, in using STAN and Bayesian frameworks, STAN's an amazing platform, really, you know, fantastic. It's now got really great. Uh, R packages which allow uh, it to be run without uh, some of the pain of writing the R script itself, uh, the stand script itself rather. Uh, but you know, disaggregating you know the deviance across these models, uh, you know, two thirds of the variation in early mortality after cancer surgery is explained by patient factors in the round, and stage is not particularly important in that, uh, and. A third is explained by hospital and uh, country level characteristics. And this is really important because it now allows us to think really clearly about what interventions can be looked at in order to improve outcomes. Uh, you know, in, in that green patient part, for instance, uh, better nutritional support is uh, almost certainly an area which will improve outcome. Uh, but in the third of variation explained at the hospital country geographical uh, level, uh, better imaging facilities, better perioperative care, etc., is almost certainly going to improve uh, improve outcome. I, I would love to talk about this in, 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 in more detail uh, to, to people. So please do get in touch if uh, you know if you want to know anything more in detail about that. A lot 
of our analysis is just done with final fit. So we wrote this package about five years ago, and the aim of it initially was to get the data out of R, it was to get our final plots, uh, you know, table one plots and regression plots out quickly into predominantly Word documents so that we could, you know, into manuscripts and send away. Uh, we'd used other packages at the time, table one, you know, for instance, we'd used, but, but nothing did quite what we wanted. But, I mean, we've really actively developed this over the last five years, and now we actually use it for most of our primary analysis just because we find it so flexible. It takes, it takes a minimum input, has lots of options under the hood, but only ever outputs for tables a data frame just a data frame, it's not anything more than that. But that gives it real flexibility in, in terms of where you, uh, you know, where you take it. So, you, you know, using Knitter, using Flextable, differences in those packages over, over, over time, uh, which, which, which maybe break other packages, we've just had no problem with that. You know, so you just, you can list, you, you can list a set of explanatory variables, you can list a dependent variable, and, and, and using one of the big functions, there's about 40 functions in total, summary factor lists, you can just get this well uh, formatted table out, it deals with, you know, well, just what you would expect, continuous categorical data, does hypothesis tests, etc. I loved the talk on GT summary yesterday, and, and uh, it's great to see, uh, you know, great to see packages like that being developed, really exciting. Uh, and I think this is a, a really important area of, uh, of our development. How do you really facilitate getting the information out as quickly as possible? Uh, so you just have to switch that summary factor list to the other one of the other big functions, which is called final fit itself. So that's the, a, a regression function. And depending on what the, the dependent variable is, whether it's continuous, whether it's categorical, or whether it's a, a survival object, it will just automatically do linear regression, GLM, or, or logistic regression, or uh, Cox proportional hazards. Uh, and uh, give you this uh, univariable, multivariable tables out, you can do uh, you, you can you take variables out if, if uh, backwards fitting is your is your bag. You can do it in, in different ways. Uh, you can pull out model performance uh, metrics, uh, and you can you, you can do more complex uh, things by using the constituent functions uh, under the hood, which put those those tables together. Uh, but we use this just quite a lot now to to. Uh, uh, to just to, both to explore models, but also to get results uh, quickly out into into the ports. And once again, just by just by changing the, the kind of single function plotting, so you can get coefficient plots or uh, odds ratios or hazard ratios depending on what you're looking at. We quite often find just reducing our, a model to to that particular format just works well, particularly when models are are maybe large and complex, and they'll go in the appendix of a, a appendix of a journal, and that plotting has various different options as well. And we uh, we 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 wrap the great serve minor package, uh, for instance, again just for our own convenience. We, I don't know if anyone used Zelig in the past, which we used a lot. It's just a, it was a kind of really great set of packages, uh, uh, which kind of started breaking for for me. I'm not sure why, but but we we quite often bootstrap our models, you know. So we're interested not necessarily in you know the co the, the, the beta coefficient of a particular linear regression model, but we're interested in how the characteristics of a set of patients uh, you know change. And uh, so you can so you can you can bootstrap on uh, a choice of of x, a choice of covariates, and uh, uh, there's kind of various functions in there which which we think are quite useful. And then there's some nice uh, missing data pipelines, so you can all, all the way through from from missing missing data diagnostics uh, around you know missing completely at random, missing at random, etc. Uh, through some wrapping of uh, of the fantastic mice package uh, to kind of final regression using uh, using mice output, uh, which is again what we use for a lot of this. And this is really all about getting results into uh, into our markdown. Really, you know, we 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 do we we are quite often now working from markdown packages, sorry, markdown documents primarily rather than uh, from R scripts and then making a document at the end. Uh, and as I'll just mention briefly, right at the end, we do teach uh, in, in notebooks style now. So, the, uh, so, so that, that 
information is sat beside the is, is sat beside the code itself. One one of the important uh, aspects of this global data uh, platform is getting the data back to collaborators so that they can look at it as easily as possible. And again, Shiny is really good for this because you, it, it is difficult with data governance getting actual raw data sets back to individuals. And uh, I'm getting quite a lot of feedback from someone's mic. My headphones are quite loud, so it's making my head shake. Uh, getting data back without necessarily sending data, you know, data the data to them. So I'm going to try and demonstrate this live. Uh, so, so Renu and the, the team, uh, you know, put these data viz, viz together. So this is a, a real data set. It can be updated really quickly. And this is about saying to collaborators, here's your data. You start exploring it while we're still, you know, finishing up the analysis and tell us what you think about it. So, uh, you know, it started off with, uh, you know, the, an explanatory variable, and then you can split it, uh, and then you can look at a, bit, a particular outcome. And you can get quite far just with understanding the data, you know, you know, to what extent does body mass index uh, impact on mortality after surgery uh, by uh, the different cancer types, etc.? So we put all of the variables into these apps and make them available. You can, you can, it's, it's, it's on GitHub, so you can you can do this for your own data. And then I decided to have a go and extended this further to an actual regression app. So so this has Final Fit under the hood, and it's uh, it's called Shiny Fit. And you can, you can just add in, you know, variables. So this is a logistic regression model, exactly the same as Final Fit. Click, click, click. There, you know, there's a, a, a regression model. I want to take some out, uh, take or add some in rather. Uh, there's that. You can uh, show final models. You can uh, include model metrics. You can subset to a, a you know particular set of data that you might be interested in. You can make missing data explicit if you want, if you want to model that, uh, and you can then uh, output that as a CSV file as the raw numbers and do more with it, or just output it into a, a Word document as a, a neatly formatted table. You can get the plot. You can cross tabs your table one uh, automatically, uh, and we've got our own glimpse functions just so you can check the underlying uh, underlying data. So this has been really useful for getting our collaborators actually using uh, uh, you know using the data really quickly rather than having to wait for months at end for uh, an analyst in a hospital somewhere in a university somewhere else to to, to give them their data back and, and please have a go with your own data so so I mean, we haven't spent a lot of time developing this but you can you can just put your own data set into that uh, and then there's a kind of prep file which is really just about the kind of mostly about the labeling and then you, you just push that into a, a, a shiny uh, package and uh, push that into uh, 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 into shiny and then use it yourself so we've got a few example data sets uh, of that good so the the second uh, project that i was going to talk about was is, is something completely different i guess so this is in high income settings although we're setting up in low income settings as well and it's really about the the, the right-hand side of promise one of health data science. Uh, it's about, uh, you know, what data can we actually get from patients that's going to be useful? And again, this is, we try to make this really pragmatic, really, uh, you know, just this is, this has got to help patients and it's got to help clinicians, uh, you know, working in hospitals actually improve patient care. So we did it as a, as a trial, and there's pros and cons. There's pros and cons to actually doing this within an RCT rather than doing it within an, a, another uh, structure. Uh, so it was kind of it, it was set up for that, and it was, as I mentioned at the beginning, around wound infections, uh, and we uh, wanted to see if we could speed up the diagnostics, the diagnosis of wound infections after patients had been discharged home uh, and to monitor their wounds, to monitor the, them remotely. Uh, and then there's this neural network project that we, we did in the back of that. So because Granny 
in Scotland, as I mentioned, is not maybe as technologically au fait as others. We base this on, on text message, on SMS, which is reasonably used more so than older patients. And so my dad still text messages, me, but the only one, everyone else is on, on WhatsApp. Uh, but the patients get a text message. It has a link to a red cap form on it. There are questions to fill in about their wound, which are based on, which is an algorithm which we're also testing based on CDC criteria for surgical site infection. Uh, and they take a photograph of their wound themselves, a, a wound selfie, uh, and that comes back. Uh, so I hope this projects. Uh, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but uh, maybe not. But uh, patients undergoing emergency surgery were recruited. They were randomised to standard of care uh, or to this intervention. Uh, we took some basic patient data, uh, including their mobile number, and put it into REDCap. Now, one of the great things about this uh, study and this approach is the whole thing is done automatically. Uh, so the text messages get sent uh, via Twilio uh, from REDCap. So REDCap has great Twilio uh, 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 interaction set up already. Uh, the photograph and the questionnaire comes back into REDCap. An email alert is uh, stimulated. A clinician makes a decision uh, about whether the patient has a wound infection or not based on the answers to the questions on the algorithm and on looking at the photograph. They go to a text message sending shiny app uh, and send a message to the patient who gets it uh, and they, they, they are strat stratified into what is essentially a low, a medium or a high probability of having a wound infection, but which translates to the patient as reassurance, everything looks okay, uh, to we're not very sure, please see your family doctor uh, or uh, come up to the hospital because we think we've got a, a wound infection. And the the text messaging from uh, R from R is really easy. So I mean, this is it. In, did I have it past? Yeah, sorry. Uh, so you get it's just an API similar. So here's here, here's the Twilio API, and then you've got your from number, your to number, and then there's uh, some uh, a mystery service ID, your user number, your token, the body, and then you just use HTTR and, uh, and a post call to that, and ping the text message appears. It's uh, fantastic. So you can obviously just wrap that into a into a shiny app and uh, use that because uh, that you know allows you to log on the background, or, uh, allows you to put a bit of uh, a, a bit of validation in to make sure, sure that uh, no mistakes happen. So we had a planned interim uh, pool of data. So this is that rather than final results. So we. Uh, saw a uh, six to eight percent wound infection rate in our patients. That's that's kind of lower, and it, and and it tells you something about recruitment in a trial. So it was patients who were having easier surgery, laparoscopic surgery, typically who were, who were recruited into the trial rather than those that were having more difficult surgery. Uh, so wound infection, so so, so our rate was uh, you know maybe lower than expected. So we do see a, a, a non-significant uh, difference in time of two days uh, from, from the diagnosis of wound infection. And we, we're, we need to do a bit more work there and there's, there's more data to come uh, on that. And it may show a difference, it may not. And I'm not sure it matters so much whether it meets its primary endpoint rather than what we've learned, uh, you know, kind of using this. Uh, but patients liked it, uh, the, you know, the the... the What's that? About 60% uh, in the smartphone group thought that, uh, act, you know, that they, they were reassured it was easy to get hold of advice about their wound. I mean, what this is about is about spinning up an idea around an intervention that might help patients, trying to avoid as part of that the pain that goes in with app development and all of that that goes afterwards. And I don't think we're suggesting that this is a, 
a, a kind of platform by which we would use this routinely in in clinical practice. I know there's a lot of chat at the moment about shiny in production and red cap in production, but we really see this as a tool for explore, exploring important clinical questions uh, easily and quickly and cheaply because it's really it doesn't cost any money to to, to do this. Many of you I know are working on uh, are are working on deep learning uh, and neural networks applied to uh, to various problems including uh, computer vision and many of you will be aware of uh, conv convolutional neural networks uh, and that approach to trying to interpret data so you're really taking an input image and reducing it down extracting features before passing it to a set of fully connected connected layers to uh, classify that into something which is uh, useful, which is often dog or cat, it seems, uh, but sometimes car, truck or van. Uh, but for us, it's wound infection or not wound infection. So the big paper in this was in Nature uh, two or three years ago from Sebastian Thrun's group uh, looking at melanoma photographs of skin lesions put through a CNN in order to diagnose, uh, diagnose melanoma. With impressive results in terms of discrimination uh, reported as equivalent to dermatologists. I mean, as diagnostics go, this is a holy grail. Melanoma is, the, I mean, it's an obvious first target for this technology and Everything that comes beyond the study is going to be more difficult, but nevertheless, this is a really impressive, you know, statement of uh, fact around the, I, I mean, right around how this technology can be deployed. So, our studio Keras TensorFlow, it's amazing. It works really well, uh, and I would really, you know, encourage anyone, particularly. You know, young people out there kind of listening to this, I really encourage you to get into this and just just try it out yourselves. So, I mean, I set this up on an on an Amazon EC2 instance. We can talk about that. Yeah, talk about that separately. I used the 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 deep learning AMI, uh, although I'm not sure that was necessarily uh, useful. Uh, I put our studio over the over the top of that. And then you can use a CPU instance to get yourself going. I mean, they, they're, they're free when you first start uh, with with kind of no power or capacity, but you can you can get everything set up and not actually uh, you know, not actually uh, pay any money. Uh, you do to run these imaging based CNNs need access to GPUs. I mean, it, it's just intractable on on a, on a CPU. Uh, and Amazon now provide these uh, P3 instances. There are other instances coming along and some of the uh, Amazon and other other providers are available. Data centers giving you access to GPUs and, and, and TPUs. You do need to be careful because they can become quite expensive. I mean, some of these are, are running at uh, $30 or $40 an hour. So you can start burning through money uh, quite quickly. I went through three hundred dollars in a weekend uh, kind of kind of setting this up, not really not really realizing it. So you do need to be careful that you, you that uh, the person paying is uh, available. So anyway, so we set up this uh, wound classification CNN. This is a kind of standard basic uh, approach uh, of, uh, of of a CNN. And I mean this is where a speaker usually says and we've got amazing results. We can predict the existence of our condition with near uh, certainty. Well, that was absolutely not the case. I mean, it was pretty rubbish uh, to begin with, and and really for good reason. I mean, that we don't have that many images. We don't have that many images of of wound infections. Uh, you know, compared with with controls, the images are not consistent enough because the patients have taken them themselves. Uh, the lighting is inconsistent. The color balance is off. Some are zoomed in. Some are out of focus. Some are some are away. Uh, and I mean, it really. It, uh, so I mean, we've. I mean, those that are into this will, will, will know that 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 is a basic start. And and we have gone through the the, the pre trained models. I mean, this is good. And, and again, the young people who haven't done this, I mean, you'd really need to get into this. 
uh, I mean, many of you know that the, the, the first layers in, this, in the, these CNNs are about extracting features, you know, common to all images, edges and textures and blobs and the like. And by utilizing models that have been built on large data sets like ImageNet, you can really improve the discrimination in your own uh, particular problem. Uh, augmentation is another uh, approach, stretching and zooming and rotating images, which you wouldn't think it would make any difference, but actually does significantly improve, improve discrimination. Uh, but this is, I mean, it does start to get expensive when you do this because these models take much longer to run. You need a uh, significant GPU resource in, in, in order to do it. But this can all be easily done through RStudio Keras TensorFlow. You don't need to you don't need to know Python to do this. I mean, we do a bit of Python, we don't do much, but you you, you can do this all real easily through the R front end. So, I mean, I think my, my conclusion from that really is, uh, you know, just to emphasize the importance of the quality of the data. I hope that's a theme that's coming through. You know, you get patients to take photographs of wounds and, uh, you know, the, the photographs, if they're not high quality, will not give you good results from, uh, you know, from, the, from these approaches. So finally, uh, as with many, I suppose of you, we uh, pivoted to COVID at the start of the pandemic and became involved in this project. So in, in 2012, the International Severe Acute Respiratory and Emerging Infection Consortium, which is a mouthful, ISARIC, had the foresight to establish what they called a sleeping protocol. So this was in the aftermath of, of SARS, and mares and was set up ready to be triggered in the event of another pandemic. So this project gathers data on patients admitted to hospital, uh, so this is the UK part of it but it's a global, a global study, admitted to hospital with COVID. It includes biological samples, so, so deep phenotyping uh, across all of the omics space together with detailed clinical data on, on these patients. So as soon as the pandemic hit, a team of research nurses across the UK immediately started enrolling uh, patients into this. And we were asked to help with the data science part of it, reporting to UK government uh, and feeding various data streams to uh, modeling groups who were who are, you know, looking to uh, try and help, particularly with policy around, uh, you know, around COVID. And there's now 80,000 patients in this data set. So, I mean, I think it probably represents the largest prospectively collected in hospital patient data set of COVID-19 patients around the world. And just a big shout out really to our studio Connect, which is just an amazing uh, platform. I'm not, I mean, I, I don't have much to do with our studio as a company. I really admire them as a company, but I'm certainly not on their payroll or anything. So don't, so all, all of my enthusiasm about our studio products is really generally as an, as an end user. So we push everything now to our studio projects. We share, uh, we, we share results in that way. We push our shiny apps there uh, and we do these markdown documents. And so, so uh, for instance, this was a dynamic report which was updating on this data set every half an hour, which uh, which was used by uh, policymakers and scientists informing policymakers uh, about the current uh, current state of the data. Uh, and this, you know, the scheduler on our Studio Connect is fantastic because you just, you know, you you run your Red, Red Cap API, the data is pulled in, you run whatever analysis you want, and uh, you get an email notification if you wish that your uh, that your, your project has been updated so this was incredible uh, and we, we would sit in meetings and you know be able to update the data in 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 meetings just in passing if any of you have used parameterized markdown it's really useful it allows you just to pass any data parameter to the markdown document through the yaml header you can kind can, of can look this up, but you know, for instance, it allowed us to quite easily just generate uh, these reports by 
UK home country, so by uh, Scotland, England, uh, Wales, this project didn't cover uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, but that was really useful. That was Tom Drake in, in, in my lab who set all that up. Again, we used extensive use of shiny dashboards uh, in order to get this all up and running, to improve data quality, to identify missing data, to motivate teams to collect data. That particular platform that was done by Tom as well is, is on the GitHub, and you can pull that down and see how that's used. And, uh, you, you know, that the COVID was or is, is as bad in the UK as it's been uh, anywhere. We, we have 32% mortality on the inpatient data set, often in older patients uh, greater than 70, often who have uh, comorbidity. And, and these were the sorts of plots that grew over time as we, uh, as we collected these data. We, I mean, in part, it was partly because of this project, but you realize just when the data is coming in uh, and quite a lot of it's missing, but not even missing, just not collected yet. But you really need to track what numbers are going into what plots. There was, there's about 20 plots and a further 10 tables in these, in these projects. I started doing something which I thought was really useful. So I just thought it would share it with you. It was, it's using the Magritter uh, T-pipe. So Magritter, as you'll know, is where the, the pipe, which has been adopted by the Tidyverse, uh, where that originally came from. And we really, I mean, we use this top to bottom programming style uh, and teach it and think it's really useful. We've completely converted to that from base R. Uh, but you can use the, the T-pipe so uh, in order to, to send out this is the status of the data at this point in the in the piped function. So if you're piping into, for instance, a ggplot, then just before uh, the plot, you just pipe out the summary data. You know, so here you have the t. The, so the t pipe allows you to send uh, that data that's coming out of that mutate function there into ggplot, but also to allow you to, with that double assignment arrow, save to the environment a further object called plot labels. And then you pass plot labels back into ggplot in order to ensure that the numbers that you uh, think are in that uh, are there are actually there, for instance, your n number. These alluvial plots are great, sometimes called Sankey plots, and, and we were using those to try and uh, track patients through, uh, through hospital trajectories. Uh, there's a number of people doing uh, work on uh, state-based models, uh, you know, using this. We're really just kind of counting up the numbers. Uh, but what this led to was us being asked to develop a model to try and predict uh, death. So lots of models have been published, some of which promise the earth uh, and perform pretty poorly in real world data sets like ours. Uh, there's there was a lot of limitations put on us, you know, in this in this project. Death was to be the outcome because that was the most robust. It had to use variables that were easily uh, available on hospital admission. It couldn't use anything fancy. And it had to be able to be used by clinicians wearing full PPE, full uh, personal protective e equipment, uh, which, which probably almost certainly meant uh, no, certainly no smartphones. So in, in our critical care unit, you're not allowed to take a smartphone in, uh, you know, while people were in PPE. Uh, which is quite limiting in terms of how you build a model to do that. But we were really looking to provide clinicians with the ability to stratify patients at that point in, in, in care. So we went through this, uh, we went through this process. I've split this up because it'll be a little bit small. I'm just going to go through this quite quickly. As with all these things, I'd love to talk about it. But uh, we have 35,000 patients at the time. We used all of the patients. Uh, that we had at the time that we started this modeling. And then we subsequently uh, collected a further 22,000 patients after that and used that for temporal validation, did a geographical and non-random split. Uh, so temporal and geographical uh, uh, validation on that. We had to multiply impute because of the, the, the missing values uh, using mice, using our final fit pipe. And we used uh, these generalized additive models, which I had used a little in the past, but not that much, uh, but they're fantastic. Uh, you know, we made an a priori decision uh, based on the brief to 
add cut points to continuous data. I'm sure people will feel strongly about that. Uh, and then we went into lasso with, uh, uh, you know, with logistic regression in order to uh, generate a prognostic index. And along that, we ran a, a machine learning comparison. We were trying to do something best in class. So we used a, a gradient boosted trees approach XG Boost, which many of you will know about, uh, what wins all the Kaggle uh, prizes. I'd love to talk about that. Uh, anyway, we 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 selected uh, we selected cut points. We went into Lasso, we penalised, we calibrated, and then we we validated. And the, these generalised additive models, which apply a spline, uh, often penalised, very very flexible, are fantastic via MGCV one of the original packages doing this. Anyone that's not done this and, and does this sort of modeling, I'd really recommend it. Uh, there's a great ggplot-based uh, visualization package now, MGC Viz. Uh, and then you can pass that into Lasso, which is a penalized logistic regression, uh, which allows you to cross-validate and choose a penalty, uh, set lambda, uh, in order to try and reduce overfitting, uh, you know, which is really the problem with a lot of these models. And you can see exactly what which of your variables are contributing most to to that. And uh, you know, this is the the model that we got out, similar to other models, but in a way different to other models. You know, so age, sex, uh, uh, pre-existing illness, physiology at the front door, urea, uh, bun, blood urea nitrogen and uh, CRP. And uh, 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 area under the curve, area under the receiver operator curve, it's an interesting statistic. I don't think I understand it. In these big data sets, we often don't see what other people show in these in, 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 in these imbalanced data sets. You know, we're often at 0 0.8, 0 0.85, uh, but we didn't see a lot of loss of discrimination, which is surprising and maybe something we should talk about, you know, going from uh, a full generalized additive model with continuous variables as continuous variables or using XG boost with quite a lot of tweaking of hyperparameters, uh, you know, through through Lasso to this final pragmatic score to be used on a bit of paper by clinicians who've got full face masks and, and, and gowns on. And it calibrated really well across the across the full range of prediction. I mean, it's a it's a fait accompli to compare your own model with other models using you know the way you've collected the data set. Of course, it will be better. But but what we have seen is that a lot of these initial models that came out into the into the press based on smaller data sets just do not perform well in our setting. They just don't work. Uh, d decision curves and, and decision utility is important, and we've uh, you know we've used that uh, here, and, and uh, we would in. in, in encourage you to kind of use that to actually show clinical utility. So the model the, the model does work well, it's easy to use, uh, and that's going to be coming out soon. I'd be interested in people's uh, thoughts on that approach. So I've had the bell on my ear, so I'm going to finish up now just with, uh, you know, this, this is the, the platform that we use. So we've got firewalled servers, the Red Cap data is held firewalled. Uh, we've got an, an Studio instance that we keep firewalled. We push to uh, uh, to an R Studio uh, connection. We uh, have uh, clicked forward on it there, uh, and, and we make ex lots of use of Slack and Trello and GitHub. We train using notebooks. All of our training materials are available free of charge here. Healthyr.surgicalinformatics.org. Uh, we're interested in notebooks. We're interested in the kind of education of uh, you know R itself. R for Health Data Science is the book that's coming out shortly. And, uh, you know, just to finish then, I think what I'm trying to show is the absolute importance of uh, the assembly of high quality data, the benefits of processing and actioning data in real time. As we would say in Scotland, R is pure dead brilliant. It is unparalleled in combined ease of use plus flexibility. It's got fantastic interfaces to all these powerful tools, Keras, Shiny. We haven't spoken today about Spark, about Stan, about Reticulate, but it's essential that it continues to integrate with these in order to continue to be relevant. Uh, Robert Gentleman suggested that clinicians won't code. I think clinicians should code, at least some of them, uh, and collaboration is at the heart of this. And I think this meeting exemplifies uh, just what a fantastic community R has. So many people behind this, you know, it's a truly collaborative effort. This is the global group 
to a meeting recently, and uh, this is in the lab. So just to finish and say thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to uh, uh, to speak to you. I've really enjoyed this meeting, and uh, I hope to learn a lot more from the the talks to come. Great, thank you, you and we have a two questions. Uh, we may not get to all of them, but I'm going to try to post the other ones in the chat. Uh, top ones about final fit. Can you combine or specify different hypothesis tests in the same table in final fit? Yeah, so the uh, so categorical and uh, continuous variables are, con are clearly uh, treated differently. Uh, you can specify the particular continuous variable uh, hypothesis test or the particular categorical various hypo uh, hypothesis test. Uh, so uh, if, if you want to do fissures and chi-squared in the same table, you can't do that. Okay. And um, can the final fit table successfully knit to Word? Yeah, very easily. And there's a vignette on the website of exactly how to do that. So that will take you through that in by step by step. Uh, it's really good just in, in a word using a template in Word and bringing that template back, adding that to the YAML header, and then you immediately have Word set up exactly the way you want it, all there on the Final Fit website. Uh, another question, do you run into information government slash GDPR issues using patient data in RStudio Connect? And if yes, how do you overcome it? Yeah, so all of these data have to go through appropriate IRB or ethical processes in the jurisdiction in which the data is collected in. Uh, we do anonymize data and we make sure that our data sharing agreements are quite specific as to exactly how we, uh, what data is pushed into, into where. So for these data, for instance, we wouldn't normally have patient level data on the RStudio Connect server, uh, but we have in uh, the uh, COVID from special dispensation around uh, uh, research practices in COVID-19. Okay. And one more, uh, with TensorFlow being built in C++ and the Keras interaction libraries being in Python, how much additional overhead or CPU cost dollars on a server do you gain by using our wrappers? Is it minimal and not worth worrying about? Yeah, I don't know that. I don't know the answer to that. I, I, my reading of uh, of Francois Colley's work is that there's not extra overheads in using the R front end versus the Python front end or others. I think if I think for people who are really really deep into this, then you know they'll, they'll, they'll probably naturally be more Python programmers than R. Uh, but uh, we haven't found any problems. Great. Well, thank you very much. I think there are going to be other questions in the chat. And uh, we're going to move on. I think Beth is going to introduce our next speaker. Thanks so much.